I've been spitting things at you like the force between these two charges, Q1 and Q2 is equal to force, let's see, that's force one on two. It's also force two on one because of Newton's third law. If this guy feels the force that direction, then this guy must feel the force the opposite direction of the same strength. Newton's third law requires that the force of one on two is the opposite of force of two on one. So if this one is pulled in, that one is pulled in. If this one is pushed out, that one is pushed out. Because you notice out, is opposite directions for these two guys' experiences. But I also want to say, we got KC, Q1, Q2 over R squared. I also want to say that this, oh sorry, this distance is R, okay. I also want to say that just like in gravitation, we can talk about a point mass here and a point mass over here, and we can talk about the distance between them, and we could say the force one on two is capital G times the mass of thing one times the mass of thing two over the distance between them square. Just like the analogy of these two equations being so nearly similar, we can also say that if you've got a large mass here, this is mass of thing one and its center is right there, and you've got some point mass over here, maybe M2, you'd still have the same force. It's as if all the mass of this spherical standard distribution, in fact, any spherical distribution, you could even have all the mass in a ring right here, or all the mass in a hollow sphere, any, even a circular, well, if it's that direction, yeah, oh my goodness. There's so much symmetry in these shapes that if you use, as long as you use this distance R, right here between the center of one and the center of the other, then you're going to get the same thing. And that's also true in electricity. You can have a charge distribution on this sphere here. And in that case, we usually call it a capital Q because it's not a point charge. But then if you have a Q2 over here, that would still be fine. And the cool thing is I can talk about the surface charge. If this is a conductor, you know that charges can move freely in a conductor, and if you splatter some charge, capital Q1, on a conductor, those charges will all move to the outside. Now, of course, if it ends up being positives, that doesn't mean that the positive charges have moved to the outside because the protons are trapped in the center with that strong nuclear force, but it means that the electrons have migrated to the inside so that we can have a net positive charge on the surface. At any rate, we can define that surface charge as sigma, and I'm going to call it, well, it's going to be charge divided by the total charge in there divided by the area of the thing. So in this case, sigma one, that's the uh, surface charge density. It's kind of a density, right? Yeah, it's kind of a density and it's an area density. So we're going to put it like that. We probably use rho if we were going to use a volume density of charge. But the wonderful thing about conductors is that charge resides on their surface. The next thing I want to do today is define the electric field. This is a big day for us. The electric field. The electric field has its analogy in the gravitational field, and of course we will extend it to discuss the magnetic field as well, because you were thinking that when I said electric field, be honest, you were. Electric field is defined like this. The electric field is a vector, and it's a, ooh, it fills all of space. Beautiful thing, right? And it is the force felt by a charge divided by how big that charge is. And really it's defined uh, by using a charge that's so small, that it's using a charge that's so small that the charge itself doesn't have an electric field. This is a mental construction because every charge does have an electric field, as we'll see in just a moment. But my point is, you have to divide the force felt by the charge by the charge, and if the charge itself created an electric field, I guess that field would be infinite in some kind of a nasty way. Ew, yuck. So electric field's units, check this out. It will have units of the units of force, our newtons, divided by the units of charge, our coulombs. So electric field is measured in newtons per coulomb. So it's about force divided by charge. We can extend this. Let's go on. What if I wanted to know the force on a charge? Force on a charge in a field. Well, that force on a charge in a field is just going to be how much charge you got times how big that field is. And guess what? If the charge is positive, then the force on it will be in the direction of the field. And if the charge is negative, then the force on it will be the opposite of the direction of the electric field. So putting a Q right there takes into account all the direction of the vector, and it's really just lovely. And I like to define, in my classes, I like to define something called a SMAP tag. 
which is a small positive test charge. And you can take that test charge somewhere. Let's say I've got this charge over here. This is a big old charge. I'm gonna call it Q1. I've got Q1 right there, and I'm gonna take a SMAP tack out of my pocket. Here, I've got one right here. And I'm gonna set down the SMAP tack right there. If Q1 is a positive charge, my small positive test charge will feel a force because of the presence of Q1. And the small positive test charge will feel a medium force right here, that direction. And now I'm gonna take another SMAP tack. Now the cool thing is that's the direction of the electric field right there. If I put another SMAP tack right here, would you agree that the force felt by this SMAP tack is greater than the force felt by that SMAP tack? So I'm going to draw a longer vector right here to represent the electric field. And also, if I put a SMAP tack right here, I'd find it, the force to be away and pretty big. And over here, it'd be away and a little bit smaller. And over here, it'd be away and just a tiny bit smaller. Over here, it'd be away and just a little tiny. Oh, my goodness, that's even too big. It'd be a tiny, tiny little vector. And then, uh, well, you see that electric field around a positive charge seems to go away from that positive charge. And if I do the opposite, I'm going to take a negative charge and set it down right here. Negative charge. I'm going to say Q2 is less than zero. If I take myself a little SMAP tack and set it down right here, that SMAP tack, this is a small positive chest charge, test charge, is attracted to Q2. And if I put it over here, it's not as attracted because it's further away. And if I put it right here, it's pretty darn attracted. Put it right here, it's not very attracted. So you see that the electric field near a negative charge goes in towards that negative charge. An electric field's this thing but it's not really a thing. Maybe it's only in the mind. No, the electric field is real. <clears throat> but the lines that we draw to represent them are not real because clearly I can draw any number of lines right here. So maybe I should give you some rules for drawing electric field lines. You want that or you want the electric field of a point charge? Let's do the electric field of a point charge. You know that the force on this small positive test charge would be, it would be, check it out, force on test charge because it's in Q2's field, that force is going to be Kc times Q2 times my test charge's charge divided by the distance between them square. And that's going to be that R, wherever we happen to put our SMAP tech at that moment. But of course, <clears throat> we hope that the force on our test charge will depend on how far it is away from our other charge, the one that we're actually, the real charge. Test charge is just in our mind. So if we want to know the electric field, that'll be the electric field of Q2. Well, we could say that it is the force on test charge divided by test charge. And then if I take this and divide it by the test charge, I'm just going to get Kc times, well, I'll just do it out for you here. Q0 over R squared divided by Q0. Q0 cancel. Of course, the test charge doesn't affect the field of Q2. That would be ridiculous. It turns out that that's just going to be Kc Q2 over R squared. All right, fair enough. There's nothing to this field of a test chart, a field of a field of a charge. A point charge has an electric field that it gets smaller as you get further away from it. And I guess if you get more charge at that particular spot, you'll have a bigger field. All that is very reasonable. Cool. You want to do anything else? Nah, we'll leave it right there.